Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. Jason, welcome back to the Duocast, my friend. Well, thanks for having me back, Brian. Yeah, so what'd you think of the Hugo Morrow episode? Uh, Hugo is an interesting guy. I uh, looked up a bunch of his art and was looking through some galleries and kind of seeing some of his work. And some of it I get, some of it I don't. And I think that it, uh, I think maybe that's part of the whole thing with art is, you know, you find your own interpretation of it. Hugo, I think, is one of these guys that isn't afraid to, like, take a chance. You know, when it comes to uh, starting a project, he dives right in and it's like, could be a very complex project, could be something very simple, but his interpretation of it is very interesting to me. Some of the work is very cool. Yeah, you know, I appreciate artists that are trailblazers and don't focus too much on the commercial aspect of their career. I'm sure every artist would love to have commercial success and have accolades and money and, and, all, and he's had that. He's had success with collections all over the world. But his focus seems to be on creating things that maybe are a little more challenging, not intentionally, but that's where his soul takes him. Yeah. And that's why he's putting up burnt chairs on the wall and, <laughs> and uh, coming up with these creations that are not something, and these are his own words, not something that you, it's not wall art, in other words. Right. Uh, so you're not going to hang it above your couch necessarily. Some may do that. But I really like the courage that it takes to take those expectations of what you would think an artist would normally have about the profession of art and to throw those out the window and say, you know what, I'm going to blaze my own path here. Yeah, exactly. Another thing I like about Hugo is that he hails from Cuba. So his first 12 years of his life was spent in Cuba. And then he goes to New York City and he's dropped into the hub of the art world in New York City, where he cuts his teeth and kind of learns what the art world is all about and what it isn't about. And he goes to school there and dives in deeper into the academia part of art and then makes his way to Miami, which is a completely different world uh, from an art standpoint, and then finally makes his way to the Pacific Northwest. So this is a guy that brings with him a lot of travels. He's been a lot of places. It's nice to see artists that bring with them this wealth of varied geographical experiences, because as you know, Jason, wherever you live can have a big impact on how you look at the world. What is the lens through which you're interpreting current events? And what is the lens through which you are creating? Right. So if you have someone who is born and raised in the Pacific Northwest, their art is no less meritorious or worthy of, of mention even if their perspective is just Pacific Northwest. But when you have an artist who actually has experienced internationally, you know, the, the art scene like Hugo has, I think you really bring something to the table that other artists don't. It also was really cool to hear Hugo talk about the challenges of making a living and how do you do this? I mean, how do you put food on the table and pay the rent when perhaps the art that you're putting out there is not as commercial as other artists who are actually selling art that you put on the wall above the couch. And so when you have that approach to art, you're not always going to have a steady stream of income that's going to allow you to thrive financially. So how do you fill the gaps? How do you fill the voids? And he talked about the grants that he does and working as an art gallery director or as an adjunct professor in an art school. Mm -hmm. And so you really get the sense of possibility that artists have that you do not have to necessarily sell everything that you're creating to make a living. You can actually make a living in the art world by teaching or by working in galleries and still be able to tap into that creativity and put out the work that you want to do without necessarily worrying about when am I going to sell my next piece? Right, exactly. You know, and I really enjoyed his journey. Just listening to him talk about where he started, where he ended up in the Northwest, and that's all accumulative and all an influence on what he creates today. Yeah. That stays with him for the rest of his life. You know, all of those experiences in his life 
And I loved how he talked about not taking school necessarily seriously back in the day because he was more into nightclubbing than anything. I thought that was actually kind of funny. Yeah, it shows that he has humility. Oh, yeah. And he, rec you know, he recognizes that he did not take art seriously or at least art education seriously back then. And that kind of sent him in a different direction. But it's nice to hear someone talk honestly about how they made their way through their teens and 20s and trying to make decisions about what direction to go. Art school versus just jumping right into the scene. And he's in New York City, too, where I think New York City is very likely another form or version of art school because you're actually experiencing it firsthand and you're hanging around a bunch of like-minded people, including Andy Warhol. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's actually at galleries with Andy Warhol back in the 80s. Amazing. And that has to be a formative experience for an artist like Hugo. So it's nice to connect to someone from the Pacific Northwest too. I really, you know, that's where we are. And, and I have a special affinity for the Seattle area and the folks that live there and try to create in that environment. So it's nice to talk to Hugo. It's a great talk. So big news in the last couple of weeks, Jason, uh, I, I know this news hit you harder than it hit me because of our connection to this man, but Eddie Van Halen, rest in peace. Oh, Eddie Van Halen, man. You know, I'm still not. I'm still not able to process it other than the fact that um, he's been sick for a very long time. He's been dealing with a, some form of cancer after the other basically over the last 10 years. Um, it started off with uh, lung and tongue cancer about 10 years ago. Had to have a third of his tongue taken out. He was actually able to beat that and then got throat cancer. So he's just, he's uh, always been a heavy smoker. And I know he was. Uh, He's had some stuff to deal with over the years as far as addictions and stuff like that. And the one thing that he had the most trouble with was kicking cigarettes. Mm. And it was actually part of the reason why his first marriage with Valerie didn't work out. It's because she just kind of said, you know, look, you got to get your shit together. You got to quit smoking for your kid, for me. And if you're not able to do that, I, I can't be a part of this. And so they ended up getting a divorce because of just his inability to sort of want to change. And he just kind of refused to give that up until it was too late. But the good thing about all of this is the music that he left behind is going to stand the test of time. It's going to be here forever. We always have it to listen to. And we can always look back on that experience and the Van Halen experience, if, if you were into Van Halen, as a very positive experience. It was very fun. It was a good time. And uh, m most of the music is really great. The reason I said at the beginning that this probably hits you harder than it hits me is that I, I really didn't have a strong connection to Van Halen in the 80s and the late 70s. In the late 70s, I was too young, but early 80s is kind of when I became musically conscious and aware. And my, one of the first albums I bought was the 1984 album. Good album. Yeah. It's, it's a, actually, it still holds up today. It's, it's, I think it's one of the better Van Halen albums, but I think that's because I look at Van Halen as more of a, a commercial act and that those songs on 1984 were very poppy and commercial. And so it, it was accessible for me. I think the older stuff and the guitar solo stuff for me didn't really resonate as much as other bands like Yes or Rush or The Who. I was really into more classic rock or I should say 70s rock as opposed to 80s rock. Mm. And, uh, but th that doesn't mean that I didn't have immense, immense respect for Eddie Van Halen and the entire band. I mean, they definitely hold a place in history as one of the most influential rock bands of the 1980s oh, yeah. and, um, and will forever. I mean, they, they really go down in history as one of the greatest rock bands from that era. So, yes, you know, it's, it's always sad to see a legend like, and we lost Neil Peart from Rush and we're, we're losing a lot of people and it's just that time. So we looked up to the folks that were probably 10, 20 years older than us when we were teenagers in the 1980s. Yeah. And now that we're either 50 or approaching 50, the folks that we really looked up to, the rock legends, are at that age where they're just going to start passing away. Yep. And uh, the problem with Eddie Van Halen, though, is Eddie is not that old. I mean, 65 years old, now that I'm almost 50 and you're 50, does not seem that old. <laughs> so It's not that far away. It's, it's not that far away and it's just too young to die. The guy had a lot, a lot left to give musically and probably personally to his friends and family. 
And so uh, it's really sad to see someone like Eddie Van Halen go. And But it's also a nice reminder that our time is limited on this earth. Mm-hmm. And we never know when it's our time. So you got to live your life now. And I know that sounds cheesy and cliche to say, but I think about these types of things pretty much every day. Right. You know, it's not morbid. I'm not like obsessing over death and mortality, but it is in some way a gift to hear news like this. And then it causes you to reflect and you're reflecting on your own appreciation for this person and what they gave to the music community. Yeah. Uh, and then you're, you're also reflecting on your own life and saying, okay, so this can happen. I mean, it, it can happen to the people that have the best healthcare in the world and it can happen to us, obviously. And so, um, in some ways I look at this in a small way as a gift to both of us, because it gives us time to reflect on what's important in life. I agree. But I remember learning how to play the guitar. One of the first people that really kicked me into gear was Eddie Van Halen, just because of the style. It was so like blisteringly fast and just absolutely wonderful to listen to when he put it all together. Uh, my neighbor was the one that influenced me. He was the one that had the Van Halen tape, the first album. And the minute it started with Running With The Devil right into Eruption and then in You Really Got Me, that those three songs, I just was dumbfounded. And everyone that, that was influenced by Eddie Van Halen, you, you're hearing this outpouring of information now from people saying it was the same experience. They put that first album on and just immediately was like jaw hit the floor going, what is this? I look at his albums like you do, although I don't connect with them as much, but I see what a game changing album it was and, you know, running with the devil and these songs, I think there are certain songs in our, our culture that change everyone's perception of what is possible musically. Right. And, and I think Neil Peart did that with drumming and rush. Oh yeah. And especially with, you know, the, the visual aspect of it too, where you're seeing him work with a drum kit like no one's ever seen before. It's like, what is, how does he even keep, <laughs> keep up with all of these aspects of this, his drum kit? But Eddie Van Halen did things on the guitar that had never been done before. And he did it in a flashy way that no one had ever seen done before, where he's being hooked up to wires and he's being, you know, uh, sent across the stage, almost like a, it's a circus act or something. Yeah. But he's so technically proficient that for me, it just wasn't as compelling as other guitarists. He just, I, I wasn't called to him as much as I was other guitarists, but I still had so much respect for him because like I said, technical proficiency, what it does is it, it raises the bar yeah. for what is possible. And so then you have all of these young people who are trying to learn these riffs like, wait, that can actually happen. Like that's one guitar playing. That's not two guitars and it's not processed. It's like straight, you know, recorded right into the channel with no tricks or, you know, computer processing. No, this is actually real stuff that's happening. Right. And so you have guitar players that are absorbing that and then they're raising their game and trying to do something that is just as original or cutting edge. And that's what keeps rock music going, man. And it keeps it fresh and original. One thing you got to remember, too, is that uh, Van Halen was the band that pretty much destroyed disco. <laughs> it's a fact. It's a fact. By the time their second album. How is that? Well, you know, what was trending in 78, 79, you know, the, the trending music, the chart topping music when they first came out in 1978 was disco. And even bands like Kiss and the Rolling Stones were doing sort of disco albums. So mm -hmm. you had Van Halen come out of nowhere and they're just like, like a steamroller, just, <clears throat> just blowing all that stuff off the charts. And that first and second album made the top of the charts in record sales and just everybody, it changed the whole thing. And then every band in the eighties that followed suit was basically imitating them. You know, the clothes they wore, the stuff they did to their guitars, the, the, the style, the hair, the hair, yeah, the style, everybody, I mean, became, it was, it, it was so ridiculous. I mean, Eddie Van Halen at one point even said, you know, they're just, they're, they're ripping me off. And his dad would say, you know what? Imitation is the biggest form of flattery, Ed. You know, you should be happy about it. Yeah. I also appreciate, I know we're talking a lot about uh, Van Halen here, but <laughs> yeah, um, I think they deserve this mention. So when they, when they came to America, I think they were five years old, at least Eddie was five. Mm -hmm. Eddie and Alex did not speak English. 
Right. So they had challenges just learning the language and trying to fit in. And, um, you know, that might be one of the reasons why, and I've never heard a podcast interview with Eddie before, but I would imagine that the alienation that they felt when they first got to America may have been one of the reasons that they were able to be so cutting edge and so different because they probably felt different. And that was just part of growing up is that they're unique. They are special. They are super sharp because they're able to change their country and their their language at the age of five yep. and adapt that way. And then create this band, like you say, that becomes this game-changing band that completely influenced the direction of, of rock music in the 1980s. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, Jason, I texted you the other day about a documentary that I saw on Netflix. It's called My Octopus Teacher. Oh, yeah. And uh, I wanted to share with you a little bit about that because I haven't talked to you yet, yet about it, but this is a very special documentary. And, and by the way, when I talk about shows on Netflix or albums or books that I'm reading, you know, I'm not getting paid to promote these things. They're just things that I think are so special that I want other people to experience them like I did. And this documentary, My Octopus Teacher, is one of those special movies that I think everyone should try to watch with their spouse or their partner or their kids or all of the above. It's a uh, it's the story of a man in South Africa who finds this kelp field right outside of his home in South Africa and finds an octopus. And I'm not going to give too much away, but there's a relationship that forms between the octopus and this man that is documented by a film crew over the course of a year or so. And what is revealed in this relationship is a very special connection that humans can have with wildlife and with the ocean and with Mother Earth. And, um, and, th and there's this give and take in the relationship, and it's really hard to describe without giving it away because there are certain aspects of this documentary that you just have to experience for the first time. I don't want to set expectations about what happens at all in this relationship with this octopus. It sounds strange to call it a relationship, okay? but it's, um, it's a very cool, surprising, original documentary, and I highly recommend it. I'm definitely going to have to check that out. I didn't realize that, what that was about. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I would love it. Another documentary that I sent you a, a link on to recently was um, a song exploder show on Netflix. It's called Song Exploder. Did you have a chance to watch any of those episodes? I watched the REM one. Oh, the Losing My Religion one. Yeah. What'd you think? That's my cup of tea, Brian. That's the stuff that I really enjoy is dismantling of a song part by part. And the part I liked about this one in particular is just Michael Stipe's reaction to his own vocal uh, when it was isolated. And it looked like he was going to cry. I'm glad you brought that up, Jason. And just so the audience knows what I'm talking about, Song Exploder is a podcast. It's originally a podcast where the whole concept was the host would talk to the songwriter or composer and it's usually a song that made its way into pop culture somehow, and it's pretty popular. And he would break down or deconstruct the song with the artist on the podcast. And I thought that the podcast went away because I saw on Twitter that they were having copyright problems mm. and they weren't able to continue to play these podcast episodes because record companies were threatening to sue, basically. Yeah. So I thought Song Exploder was going away, and it was actually a great podcast and an awesome concept for a show. And then I'm on Netflix the other day, and I see this new show called Song Exploder. So I look in those episodes, and sure enough, it is the same folks who were doing the podcast, but now they have this very highly produced, excellent series called Song Exploder on Netflix. And the concept is the same. They sit down and they break down, they deconstruct songs with artists. There's Alicia Keys on there. That's one episode. There's a hip hop artist on there. I haven't seen these other episodes, but I did watch the REM Losing My Religion episode. And I agree, Jason, that scene where Michael Stipe is listening to his isolated track mm -hmm. for probably, I think for the first time in his life, hearing this isolated track, he may have heard it when he first recorded it, but and then to see Michael Stipe's eyes get teary 
and the intensity on his face. And he's talking about how strange it is to, after all of these years, go back and listen to the actual bones of this song. Mm -hmm. And it was really cool to hear all of the the folks in REM, Peter Buck and Mike Mills, they're listening to these tracks and they're being asked about what it was like to record the song. And it's funny because none of them seem to have a vivid recollection of everything that went into that song. And that's because it all came together very quickly. Right. I think they recorded it in one day. They did. But I, I love that concept of taking something very special, like a Losing My Religion is one of those songs that when you hear it on the radio or you're walking through a store and you hear it on the, the PA system or wherever you hear Losing My Religion, it takes you back to a period of time in the 1990s where even if you didn't have an REM album and you weren't a huge REM fan, that song represents a certain time in your life. Yeah. Because it was everywhere. It just blew up. And it was an REM for me happens to be one of my favorite bands from the eighties and nineties. So I, I never saw them in concert. Actually, I may have seen them in concert. <laughs> if I saw them in concert, it was probably only once or twice, but really my experience with REM was uh, sitting around with my friends on weekends, trying to figure out REM songs, how to play them, how to sing them. They were a big part of the music scene in my, my circle of friends. In my circle of friends, we were a little bit more like in the metal to like grunge sort of parameter. So during that particular time, I was really into like Alice in Chains and stuff. So, but I worked in radio back then and I got to hear REM all the time. That song, especially that was a, that was a big hit. So mm -hmm. we had that one on rotation quite a bit and it, it still holds up. It's still one of those songs that holds up. I agree. I think it is one of those songs that still holds up and it's a song that you could play for your kids and they'd probably say, oh, is this, you know, a song that just came out? They're not going to look at it as a song that's old or dated. That mandolin at the beginning makes it stand out as so unique because very few songs actually lean into a mandolin being like the main instrument that kind of guides the melody. I, I don't think I can think of another one. I mean, there's, there's a, a couple of Led Zeppelin songs, I suppose, that use the mandolin similarly but not as as boldly as rem did oh sure battle of evermore yeah so uh so what do we have coming up next jason uh we have an interview with neil preston oh my gosh neil preston is such a legend and he's a legend that probably very few people have actually heard of but when you start looking at his work you realize this guy is so tuned into rock history because he was there in it backstage on private jets at concerts in the front row and stage left and stage right, taking the most iconic photographs of rock stars. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things about photographers is that you always know the photograph when you see it. You're like, oh my gosh, that picture of Freddie Mercury at the stadium in, in London, or that picture of Robert Plant is embedded in your mind. It's sort of singed into your psyche as kind of like the essence of this band. Exactly. Well, Many of those photographs were taken by Neil Preston. So Neil talked to me about his career and I was laughing out loud at some of the stories that he was telling. <laughs> and some of them are, are not safe for work stories or not safe for kids. So get ready for that. <laughs> and, uh, don't listen to the episode with, uh, with young kids around, but he's a, he's a fun guy. He's still at it. He's still traveling with bands and he'll be back on the road as soon as COVID allows for concerts to, to go forward. But the reason we are timing the release of this episode when we are, because we talked to him you know, way back in, I think, uh, er, early September, mm -hmm. but we're timing the release of his episode with the release of a book that he has coming out on Queen. Nice. And it's a Queen coffee table book, I guess you'd call it, but it has tons of amazing images. And I already have one of Neil Preston's books. It's called Exhilarated and Exhausted. And it has a lot of these iconic photos that I just talked about. But this new book that's coming out on Queen is pretty exciting because it has a lot of obviously Queen-centric photographs from their world tours all the way through South America, North America, Europe. And uh, it's a, Queen is obviously a very special band to, uh, to you and to me. And they're probably 
one of the most talented, technically proficient bands in rock history, but also just from a pop standpoint and the way that these songs made their way into pop culture because they're so accessible, yet they're so technical and complicated that they can appeal to kind of geeks like you and I, <laughs> but they can also appeal to the masses. Like, you know, We Will, We Will Rock You is a lyric that I would bet you even 10-year-olds would be able to, to sing to without even thinking about it today, even though that song came out decades ago. Or Bohemian Rhapsody, same thing. I mean, these are songs that are so complicated compositionally and technically, but for some reason, they've made their way into our pop culture to the point where everyone, grandmas, grandpas, young kids, teenagers, they all love Queen. Queen is such a great band and Neil Preston is one of the best rock photographers ever. So I was honored to talk to him and uh, capture that conversation in an interview, which we'll put out next week. What I liked about Neil in looking at his work, I've seen a lot of those pictures before, just in publications, um, rock magazines, things like that. And I remember looking through your, that book that you have and going, oh, I remember this. That's cool. I didn't know that was Neil. Right. You know, one of the great things about Neil's interview is that if you have the book, Exhilarated and Exhausted, you can flip through the book and turn to a lot of the photographs that he's talking about during the interview. And I think you'll get more out of it that way. Or just use Google. Just try to find some of his images on, on Google as you're listening to the interview. And you really get to hear the behind the scenes story of how some of these photographs came together because there is a story behind every photograph in that book. And we didn't talk about every photo. But there are some really fun, adventurous stories on how they came together and what a life Neil Preston has lived. If you're a Led Zeppelin fan, you're really going to appreciate this interview with Neil Preston. That's all I'm going to say. Totally. Yeah, you got to listen. All right, brother. It's always good to connect with you on the Duo Cast, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. Yeah, we'll talk to you next week, man. All right. See ya. Hey, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at DreamPathPod. And as always, go find your dream path.